Did you correctly answer D, 53%? That's right, 53% of the state funding in, uh, 50, uh, of the state budget in 1970 went to K-12 public education. If we had that same uh, percentage today, there would actually be an additional $3.05 billion for public education in North Carolina. We're gonna continue our conversation on school funding. We have two great guests with us. We have, first we have Dr. Eric Hout from UNC Chapel Hill, and, uh -huh. I, have, and I have to say Go Heels, because go Heels. this show is a uh, Final Heels. Four weekend. <laughs> and, we're, and we've got Representative Kevin Corbin. Yes, uh, thank you for being here. Representative Corbin, you're from District 120, which is Cherokee, Clay, Graham, and Macon County. So you're yes, in sir. the mountains. The so. far west, there beautiful you. part of the state. It is a beautiful part. I tell you, when you start getting up in the 90s here, we may want to go hang out with you in your district. Exactly. All right, well, look, I want to start with you first, Representative Corbin, because sure. I know you've been in involved um, in the uh, some of the education discussions and legislation going yes. on. Yes, I um, the General Assembly has started down a path at looking at possibly overhauling and changing the school finance system for the yes. state. Why? You know, so what do you hope to accomplish? Well, currently the, the state funds teachers, for example, ki uh, kindergarten teachers uh, are funded at one teacher for every 18 students per uh, school system. Um, and we're looking at maybe uh, trying to overhaul that and, and maybe uh, customize that for each school system and maybe funding a little more fair. Right, okay. Now you, um, um, you know, I know you, you and I were talking before we started taping about some of the counties. You know, you've, you've yes. kind of got some, you've got some, in fact, I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about it. You've got some K-12 schools, the entire we school. Do. So you've got some, it's very different than a school, <laughs> like my daughter's high school here in Raleigh had 3,000 students. Right, <laughs> and, and that funding per teacher is a little easier in those large school systems. And for example, my home county of Macon County, we have two K-12 schools, kindergarten through 12th grade. And those are small schools, and uh, that funding's a little little harder to make work in those. So you, so you think that the, the, the current system is a little not, not flexible enough? Yeah, it's a little harder for rural school systems. Eric, um, you've studied this. You've looked at our, uh, our North Carolina's funding system. You've also mm -hmm. looked at um, systems in other states. Um, Big picture, sort of what, how do they compare? Well, the one interesting piece about North Carolina's funding model is there's no other one like it across the country. Uh, so we have 50 different states with different f school finance mechanisms. Uh, North Carolina's provision of uh, teacher allotments, positions for numbers of students, this ratio-based system, is, is very unique. And, and because it's unique, it makes it more difficult to understand uh, and more difficult to compare to what other states are doing. Right. Now, um, You've, I think that what we hear most about it, we hear about the allotments, which is what we do here, and, the, and the legislature has been talking a lot about weighted uh, uh, student uh, form, student-based fu funding form. How, so how, does the, how do those systems compare and sort of what is the more common method right now? Sure, so a pupil weighting system is, is more common across the 50 states, and that works by attaching a revenue amount per pupil and then adjusting that revenue amount based on any characteristic of the pupil themselves or the district or the school that they're attending. Right. Now, Representative Corbin, I'm sure you've probably talked to some legislators, I mean, I've talked to some um, school superintendents and districts. Sure. Change can sometimes be a little scary, right? It can be. I, I think everybody's used to the way they're doing it now and, and counties have adjusted, but uh, currently you have a lot of local funding for these teacher positions that we talked about uh, because in especially rural districts when you have the uh, the numbers don't work out exactly right. You have a lot of local funding. For example, my home county probably funds 30 uh, teachers uh, locally, which uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but that's probably $1.5 million, which right. is hard for a small county. Well, it's actually in, in, in our report, we talk about the uh, really the blurring of the lines. It's really, even though uh, the money is, is primarily coming from either the you know, state or federal government, right. um, there are a lot of locals now that are funding positions, teaching right. positions assistant principals, uh, TAs, a lot of them are funded. In, in most of my, uh, my four counties that I represent, I would say that 80% of the funding comes from the state, uh, roughly 5% is federal, and about 15% is uh, local, funded by the local counties. All right, now, let me ask you, Eric, but how do we balance making sure all counties have um, adequate resources, uh, the, the counties uh, like Representative Corbin is talking about, sure. without penalizing um, other counties. I mean, because it, 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 it seems like it will be, it's going to be a challenge to completely change the system without having some winners and losers. Sure. Well, the, 
the important fact to note is there are winners and losers right now. Just okay. the winners are used to winning and the losers are used to losing. Good point. So mm -hmm. uh, changing that calculus is going to change who the winners and losers are. Uh, there's a lot of governmental legislative things you can do with grandfathering, soft landing provisions, but you can also look at an, any number of systems across the country that allow wealthy systems to still advantage themselves but build a really firm sort of floor or foundation for lower wealth districts uh, to be able to have adequate resources. Now are there, um, um, we, you talked a little about the differences, are there strengths and weaknesses? I mean again our system has been in place for a long time, are there strengths? for a system like us, ours, other than it just it happens to be the one that everyone knows? So, it, <laughs> well, familiarity is nothing to, to cast away lightly. That yeah, is right. an important aspect of it. The position-based system is really focused on getting human resources into schools. And it, I think, sets a tone and a tenor across the state, and it helps superintendents and finance officers know that that's what the business of education is. Right. Let me go back to you, Representative Corbin. They, um, um, obviously, the focus of all this is on the students, right. on the children. So, right. um, I mean, do you so do you think the you know we talked about in our report uh, the whole idea of adequacy? Um, do you think that this is an opportunity um, in changing the system to also look at how much we're providing to make sure that it's enough? Right. Well, one thing I wanted to mention was uh, the classroom flexibility, the class size flexibility you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and that's some legislation actually that I uh, was one of the primary sponsors on was to allow superintendents to uh, have uh, flexibility in how many students are in those classes, right. which helps them with the funding. And in my opinion, that's going to make it uh, a lot easier for the uh, counties to meet those budgets. So, so a little bit, I think, uh, uh, Eric, you had mentioned uh, yeah. earlier, the, it, it, is, it, it, it could potentially be more transparent in terms of being able to see, uh, well, again, how the money is being spent and used, but also... Um, is it, you know, is it enough? Is it adequate? Is it equitable? Are you re reaching the kids? Exactly. E equally distributing insufficient resources is still a net loss for the kids of North Carolina. Right. Uh, something like a pupil weighting system allows you to put a number out there where you say, this is how we value a kid coming from an economically disadvantaged background. How does that compare with what South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and Virginia are doing? Yeah, have you looked at, have you compared to see like the, like the, we've got the uh, low wealth county funding and the small county, how that compares? Just other... some, some back of the envelope calculations using public available data. If you look at the Disadvantaged Student Supplemental Fund, it's uh, on average about a 5% sit on top of what the state's already providing to districts. So if you tried to transfer that into a pupil weight and you were generous because maybe I did the math wrong, maybe you say it's a 7% to 10% addition, um, which is, you know, about what um, Mississippi does, for example. Right. Uh, last word from you. Um, what do you, so at the end result, do you, do you want to see a new system or do you think we still got to uh, learn a little bit more? I, I do think we need to redo the system. Uh, um, the legislation is moving through to form that uh, uh, joint committee. Uh, I hope to be on that. I, right. I would like to be part of that process, but I do think we need to, to strongly look at uh, the way we fund our school system. Excellent. Well, I'm sure your your uh, your constituents back home appreciate you looking out for the Absolutely. schools. And Eric, thank you for, for being a resource for us, uh, not on the show, but also on this other report. So thanks Absolutely. so much for being here. Thank you. When we get back, this week's Leadership Spotlight. <laughs> 